using this. Um, very happy to be here. My talk, so I've changed the title of my talk um, uh, to focus more on Hegel um, because I thought that this would uh, be a way of en engaging a little bit more directly with the, uh, the theme of the conference. Um, it will, uh, so my, my paper is tangential to the, you know, the, the explicit conference topic, but I, I do hope it will connect with it. And I will, it will take me, a, 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 first of all, I'll say something about Hegel, then I'll talk about the, uh, the interpretations of Hegel um, developed by Slavoj Žižek and Madame Dolar, both of whom are speaking uh, at, this, at this conference. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the talk, I, I hopefully I will kind of connect it to issues about the um, uh, relationship between uh, psychoanalysis, uh, capitalism, and politics. Okay, so, um, okay. Um, so I begin with this quote from Zizek, which I think is kind of a very, very kind of a, you know, illuminating and important quote. There is no spirit without a machine. The appearance of spirit is a machine which colonizes the organism. The victory of spirit over mere life appears as a regression of life to mechanism. So I take this to be Zizek's encapsulation of you know, um, you know, the crux or what is one of the most significant aspects of his Lacanian interpretation of Hegel, and I, and I, I think this is a, an interpretation that is particularly um, necessary now because I think what separates Hegelians or contemporary Hegelians is over the extent to which Hegel can and should be understood as a neo-Aristotelian. And the Lacanian, it seems to me that the, the virtue of the Lacanian interpretation is to disqualify any Aristotelian reading of Hegel precisely by not uh, helping oneself to the kind of the, the distinction between first and second nature. Okay, the class of Aristotle introduces this distinction between first nature and second nature. Um, human beings as rational animals are part of the natural order, but they have purposes, they have uh, capacities, cognitive and spiritual capacities, which are irreducible to fusis, to the movement, the becomings of, uh, of, in, of the inorganic. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the distinction between second nature, which is underwritten by very influential you know, uh, contemporary kind of philosopher, you know, readers of Hegel such as John McDowell, in, in a way is seen to be, um, in a way aligns uh, mindedness with organicity. Okay? It aligns mindedness with organicity such that um, human purposes, human purposes and activities um, are to be understood um, in terms of a, you know, a complexification or the merging out of um, organic teleology. Okay, so psychic or cognitive teleology is superimposed onto, onto biological uh, function. Um, and this quote by, is very, very interesting because the point, um, as Zizek points out, second nature the recurrence or the, you know, the, the repetition of nature within the life of spirit is in a way it's a, it's a reiteration of the inorganic of lifelessness within life or of death within life. Um, and this is why in a way um, the uh, Hegel's key claim is that if the life of spirit of spirit is precisely that which tarries with the negative or incorporates death within itself, there is a kind of, uh, you know, there's a, a psychic life um, is structured around these lifeless repetitions or these purposeless uh, drives, okay? And the drive is this kind of, uh, uh, this uh, the repetition or the, the, the reoccurrence of lifeless purposelessness within purposeful life, okay? The machinery of spirit has both a formal and a material aspect, and it's the interdependence of the matter and form that I w I'd like to examine here. Um, so first of all, I want to say something about Hegel, um, yes, about the <coughs> form in Hegel, and Hegel presents a phenomenology as a science of the experience of consciousness, um, where he begins, and you know, there, there's lots of ways of, um, in which the phenomenology has and can be unpacked, but the introduction to that text um, has a straightforwardly epistemological agenda. Um, and 
Hegel is concerned with the problem of, of knowledge. How can, you know, how is something like, uh, you know, absolute knowing achievable? Um, he's struggling with um, skepticism on the, the so-called problem of the cri criterion, which is that to separate true beliefs from false ones, we need a true method, but to separate true methods from false ones, we need true beliefs. We must already know that our belief that this is the true method is true. But if we already know that we know something that is true, then we don't need a method to separate true beliefs from false beliefs. So this is the, the classic problem of the criterion, um, which is usually resolved by you know, resorting to some form of foundationalism. Uh, you find a point of contact between thought and being, which provides this absolute footing for, for cognition. This is exactly the kind of foundationalism that Hegel disqualifies. Um, so Hegel writes in the, uh, section 84 of the introduction, in consciousness, one thing exists for another. Consciousness regularly contains the determinateness of the moment of knowing, and at the same time, this other is to consciousness, not merely for it, but is also outside of this relationship, or it exists in itself, and this is the moment of truth. So consciousness is consciousness of something, both as it is for consciousness and as it is in itself, independently of consciousness. So consciousness for Hegel is the consciousness of the difference between knowing, or what is for consciousness, and truth, or what is in itself. And this difference provides Hegel with the criterion he seeks. Natural consciousness, or what he calls phenomenal knowledge, possesses the criterion for distinguishing between what is for it and what is in itself. And this criterion is imminent to phenomenal knowledge. Knowledge, or what can we any claim to knowledge, knowledge in its most immediate um, naive form. Um, so um, Hegel continues, therefore, consciousness provides its own criterion from within itself so that the investigation becomes a comparison of consciousness with itself. For the distinction made above between truth and knowing, or between the absolute and the relative, falls within consciousness. That's what in what consciousness affirms from within itself as being in itself or the true, we have the standard which consciousness itself sets up by which to measure what it knows. So this is why Hegel insists that um, consciousness, or what he calls self-consciousness, has a constitutive relationship to conceptualization. He says consciousness is its own notion, where the notion is the concept. The notion is at once knowledge, i.e. what the object is for consciousness, and truth, i.e. what the object is in itself, or the essence of the thing. So on the one hand, Hegelian phenomenology measures the extent to which the notion or the concept corresponds to its object, knowledge corresponding to the object, uh, and the object is, is the truth, the independent um, uh, dimension, while on the other hand, it measures the extent to which the object Right, truth corresponds to its notion or knowledge. So he continues, if we designate knowledge as a notion, but the essence or the true as what exists or the object, then the examination, i.e. the examination of the structure of um, the science of the experience of consciousness consists in seeing whether the notion corresponds to the object. But if we call the essence or in itself of the object the notion, and on the other hand, and on the other hand, understand by the object, the notion itself as object, viz. as it exists for another, then the examination consists in seeing whether the object corresponds to its notion. It is evident, of course, that the two procedures are the same. So this is why Hegel will insist that um, you know, the, every, the concept of the object contains the the, you know, the, the, the criterion of truth or of absoluteness by which you can, to which knowledge itself is accountable. Um, this is why Hegel will say that for philosophical science, what is concretely as opposed to abstractly real or actual, the German word is Wichlichkeit, this is the, the word actual, um, um, is the notion as the unity of knowledge and truth or subject and object rather than either moment considered separately. Um, so, consciousness then is the notion of itself. It relates to itself as another. Um, this is uh, section 80, once again from the introduction. Consciousness is explicitly the notion of itself. Hence, it is something that goes beyond limits. And since these limits are its own, it is something that goes beyond itself. And this 
process of self-overcoming, consciousness is self-overcoming in trying to secure the truth about its object, generates the process of uh, what I'm going to call phenomenological recursion. Phenomenological recursion is, a, in a way, a kind of a toy, it's a kind of a toy formalization of the experience of consciousness. Okay? Um, I'm not going to read out this whole quote, I'll just, um, this is Hegel's account of um, how the, uh, the transition between um, one object of knowledge, where there's a distinction between knowledge and truth, and the, uh, the overcoming of the limits of knowledge and the grasping the truth of the object in itself generates a new object of knowledge in which the difference between, the original difference between truth and knowledge is reinscribed. So you get something like this. Um, in, in, in stage one, you have knowledge for consciousness one is contrasted with truth in itself, so, you know, the first object. Um, in stage two, you have knowledge for consciousness two, which is itself contained or structured around the difference between knowledge for the first consciousness and truth for the first consciousness. And this is contrasted to the, the new truth, the new truth of the object. And of course, this process, can, you get a, pro, a kind of a recursive process where you can keep on embedding these structures, uh, these concatenations of structures, of differences, um, you know, as a, as a, through the, the unfolding of the, uh, the science of the experience of consciousness, okay? Now, um, what's left out of a kind of uh, a trivial formalization like, like this is the dimension of negativity. Um, recursiveness is not deduction. There is no inference involved in recursion. Recursion is a mechanism, okay? It's an operation, but it doesn't involve any inference, okay? Uh, now, inference and inferential necessity then, for Hegel, is precisely what can only be seen from outside, externally, okay? And, um, so this, this is where Hegel makes a distinction between what is for what the, uh, the content experienced by consciousness um, and the truth, what is for consciousness and what is in itself for the knowledge of that consciousness. Okay? And this is where he's saying that there's something going on behind the back of knowing consciousness. And it's what's going on behind the back of cognitive consciousness that is seized by the phenomenological observer, the Hegelian philosopher, who is tracking this uh, recursive process to convert mechanism into necessity, okay? So, um, I'll read out the, the sections in bold. It is just this necessity itself or the origination of the new object that presents itself to consciousness without its understanding how this happened, which proceeds for us, as it were, behind the back of consciousness. So in the movement of consciousness, there occurs a moment of being in itself, or being for us, being for us, the, the observers, which is not present to the consciousness comprehended in the experience itself. Okay? The content, however, of what presents itself to us does exist for it. We comprehend only the formal aspect of that content or its pure origination. For, for it, for the consciousness, what has thus arisen exists only as an object, while for us, it appears at the same time as movement and a process of becoming. And it's this process of becoming that is charted by the science of the experience of consciousness. So one way of understanding absolute knowing is as the fusion of phenomenal knowledge or the object of phenomenology and science or the subject of phenomenology. And this fusion is the point at which we, the phenomenological observers, see the necessity in what was mere chance for experiencing consciousness. And the sequence of what Hegel calls determinate negations through which both subjective knowing and objective truth are compelled to satisfy their own notion. So this is very important. Is that Determinate negation, in a way, is invisible from the vantage point of the experiencing consciousness. It's only the, the observing, the scientific consciousness, that perceives the determinacy of the negation going on behind the back of experiencing consciousness. Um, now, a second consequence, you know, a second famous Hegelian claim is that essence is contradiction. Contradiction is in the thing itself, not just in a representation of the thing. 
So what Kant characterizes as a discrepancy between representation and thing is for Hegel the thing itself, insofar as it's no longer a self-identical substance, but rather a concatenation of differences, something that is not what it is and is what it is not. The difference between what the thing is and what we take it to be is internal to the thing itself. Okay? Um, so, but there's an ambiguity in this account of phenomenological recursion. Only the formal aspect of the process of becoming, or the movement of pure origination, or pure origination is grasped in its necessity, not its content. What is experienced as content remains, to a certain extent, in a way to be carefully qualified, contingent. So what is necessary is, is the form as a surplus of negativity. The true object is the nothingness of the first, but this nothingness is precisely what is not present for the experiencing consciousness. It can only be grasped retrospectively by the phenomenological observer as the in itself of the for itself. So everything hinges on how we understand this form of nothingness. Does it constitute the cognitive core of experience, what experience knows without knowing that it knows, or is it rather what resists knowing, which is to ask, is there a formlessness latent in this very form of nothingness? And this is to ask to, to what extent form coincides with what Hegel calls the concept. Recursion is, as I've already said, recursion is an automatism, not an operator of necessity. Without, while necessity is logical compulsion, recursion, recursion is mechanical compulsion. So the science of the experience of consciousness proceeds through the formalization of nothingness, precisely of what is not for natural consciousness. Um, this is why Zizek then, I think, gives this very um, useful encapsulation. Hegel, there is, an, a notion, there is an unconscious in Hegel, but it's, an unconscious, it's the unconsciousness of form. Um, the Hegelian unconscious is formal. It is the form of enunciation invisible in the enunciated content. I won't read the whole quote, but just focus on the section in bold. Hegel's unconscious is the unconscious of self-consciousness itself. Its own necessary non-transparency, the necessary overlooking of its own form in the content it confronts. So there's a resistance to formalization in and through form. And in this sense, the phenomenology can be read as charting self-consciousness's repeated attempts to successfully sublate, which is to say to formalize the content of its experience. Uh, this is a, and this is a quote from Rebecca Comey's Resistance and Repetition, also about um, Freud and Hegel. Um, she writes, the phenomenology is often read as a building's romance. The ultimate obstacle to enlightenment turning out not to be the opacity of things, the inscrutability of other minds, the recalcitrance of the passions or the unruliness of the body, but the resistance mounted by reason itself to its own inexorable demands. The ultimate obstacles to reason are those generated by reason. Now, and this, of course, she's going to contest this reading. She, she, wants to contest, she wants to say that there's another kind of resistance operating in and through uh, consciousness. Okay? There is this, the resistance generated by the surplus of form, but there's also a resistance at the level of, of content, of, of concrete particularity. And this is the resistance tracked by psychoanalysis. Um, so what is supposedly omitted by this edifying reading is the resistance to reason generated by a form of repetition, symptomatic of reasons other, i.e. the unconscious. The discrepancy between the form and content of experience can be crystallized in the contrast between determinate negation and overdetermination, or between sublation and iteration. And this is Zizek's account. This is the crux of the post-Hegelian rupture. Its most elementary feature from Kierkegaard to Marx is the gap that emerges between sublation and repetition. That is, repetition, repetition acquires autonomy with regard to sublation, and the two are now opposed. Either a thing is sublated, i.e. determinately negated into a higher mode of its existence, which is what Hegel wants, or it just drags on in its inertia. Um, so, and here Zizek then continues and, and uh, elaborates on what he thinks resists formalization in the content of experience. Um, and it's what he calls overdetermination. Um, uh, 
in the, dialectic, in the Hegelian dialectical process, negativity is always radical or radicalized and consistent. Hegel never considers the option of a negation that fails, so that something is just half negated and continues to lead a subterranean existence, or rather insistence. Okay, so this is, um, this is the difference in a way between conceptual negation and non-conceptual negation. Conceptual negation is always determinate, it always succeeds, whereas non-concept or you know, non-conscious has operates in another register of of negation. Um, but, the, but, but still, we, ha we have to complicate this picture. And obviously, it's clear that any kind of opposition has, you know, must be carefully qualified if we take Hegel seriously. The opposition between formal sublation and formless repetition can't be st so straightforward. A strong reading of Hegel, such as Zizek's, suggests that sublation succeeds through what exempts from it. And this is very interesting. So that this is where Zizek wants to say that uh, he wants to contrast the, you know, the account of uh, the contrast between non-conceptual negativity and conceptual negativity and the contrast between you know, Freud and Hegel or Lacan and Hegel um, with the standard philosophical um, critiques of Hegel where there's always you know, some kind of, uh, there's um, something that resists integration within the concept and this is, some, this is like some kind of uh, a non-conceptual difference a sheer particularity, etc., etc. The history of 20th century philosophy is replete with attempts to identify some, something that will kind of, uh, you know, inhibit or jam the, uh, the machinery of determinate negation. Um, and Zizek proposes that it's actually um, these, you know, he thinks that these attempts are unsatisfying because they, well, for, he just considers them, you know, problematic. And he, he considers that, he wants to say that um, if we understand Hegel, if we have a more generous reading of Hegel, um, we see that um, deter, you know, sublation or Aufhebung is precisely works by, um, by not working. It integrates the, the failure of, of determinately negating something within itself. So that this failure is constitutive of the, uh, the workings of formalization. Okay. Um, so this, here's another quote from Zizek. The, the direct attempt, well, I'm, I won't read the, because we're short of time, so I'll just read the, the end of the quote. So in this, if one reads Hegel in this way, the lesson of, he of the Hegel and Hegel is that the loft itself, the failure of, the initial failure of determinately negating something is precisely um, the condition for successfully uh, negating it, okay, um, and it's, so in, in a way, so that he, in Hegel there is the point is not to think of a kind of uh, it's not to reify the movement of the dialectic into you know thesis, antithesis, synthesis, but to think of um, a kind of uh, you know a misfire or a kind of a, a, a congenital kind of uh, you know inability or weakness as the condition for overcoming whatever resists determination. So this is why the loss itself is to be self, the loss itself is the gain. Um, so I think this is the right way to understand Hegel because the, what, you know, the movement of becoming uh, charted in the science of the experience of consciousness is a movement of desubstantialization. It's the, it's the derealization of the first object. Um, why? Because the, the absoluteness of the first object, you know, the distinction between knowledge and truth in its first iteration, turns out to be, to be false, to be unsatisfactory. And what happens is that when you overcome this first distinction, you desubstantialize the first object of knowledge. And this desubstantialization generates the successor object. Um, um, this is also why Hegel is not Aristotelian, because for him, there is no substance, there is no already constituted substance uh, within which are encoded certain potentialities or possibility. You know, if being is, you know, if the essence of being is contradiction or nothingness, nothing has a substantial form within itself, and, and, and it's impossible to say in advance what things can and cannot do. Um, there are no intrinsic potentialities in things. Um, 
But if the lesson of sublation is that loss itself is an achievement, then there may be a secret complicity between the blockages generated by reason itself and those generated by its other. Reason's resistance to itself generates another form of resistance through which reason overcomes its own resistance. Well, this would be, again, a kind of a, an optimistic. This, this is obviously the, the reading that a Hegelian will want to insist upon. Um, it may not be credible. Um, uh, here's um, a quote from Madame Dollar's Hegel and Freud. Um, it's, precise, it's the productivity of the negative um, that is Hegel's most radical insight. If there's something bewildering and interesting in Hegel, it resides in his grandiose efforts to pursue the crack, the split, okay, the split um, around which self-consciousness is uh, constituted, not as a failure or a malfunction, but as an enabling principle, to take it as the productivity of the negative. Um, he saw his task not as filling in the cracks, i.e. not, um, not he, Hegelian philosophy is not an attempt to plug in, to fill in the, the discontinuities of the, you know, to, the, the gaps in the fabric of reality, but, but to accentuate them. Um, he saw his task not as filling in the cracks, but as producing a scission where there seemed to be none, a scission that enables any positive entity. Um, now, the, now, what is, again, the reason why it's not possible to simply kind of juxtapose Hegelian self-consciousness or you know, Hegelian negativity and uh, some kind of uh, straightforward non-dialectical negativity is because, as Mladen Dora points out, there is already a kind of, uh, there's a, uh, a meaning generating activity at the level of the unconscious itself. Um, so again, the passage in bold here is uh, the one I really want to focus on. If there's a diagnosis of the philosophical endeavor, i.e. to make things meaningful or to make things consistent, um, then this business of philosophy starts already in the unconscious. The philosopher has an accomplice in the unconscious, which starts stopping the gaps even before philosophy starts filling them in. So this is, the unconscious is effaced at the same time that it is produced. Um, this is why the unconscious is not a substance. Okay? It's not some kind of entity which is, you know, whose, whose kind of uh, ontological status has to be adjudicated. And finally, um, the philosophical illusion is structural. It has its basis in the unconscious itself as effacement. Um, so, um, so what this means then is that there's a kind of, I, I guess, a kind of a, a hidden complicity between, um, you know, the operations of... Uh, no, uh, the unconscious of self-consciousness and the psychoanalytic unconscious. Um, um, there's, a, there's a kind of connection or a very kind of uh, subtle and intricate connection between the formal unconscious and the material unconscious. Um, um, so that the pure, the repetition which is constitutive of the material unconscious is a fixation or a kind of a a stuckness on particularity. And this repetition, unlike the repetition, uh, the kind of idealizing repetition that uh, generates the Hegelian dialectic um, or the, the alleged progress of uh, self-consciousness, um, is, as Zizek puts it, sustained by its impurity, by the persistence of a contingent pathological element to which the movement of repetition gets and remains stuck. Now, but again, what, what is very interesting here is that this, um, this uh, pathological element, it's not a substantial element disturbing the formal mechanism of symbolization, but a, few, but a purely formal curvature of symbolization itself. Okay? Um, a purely formal curvature of symbolization itself. So the, I think that the issue is to, to, to connect um, the surplus of conceptual form with um, the, the curvature of symbolization, a symbolization which is irreducible to conceptual form. Um, okay, I'll move on. Um, so this, and if we understand this, um, oh, oh, okay, the, the attempt to articulate these two dimensions of um, 
the, the surplus of form at the level of self-consciousness and the, you know, the curvature of symbolization. Um, we, we have to understand um, the way in which this, uh, there's an inscription of division, of a, a, a kind of a, a radical conception of Fisher in uh, Hegel's self. There's a non-conceptual uh, difference in, Hegel, uh, uh, in Hegel's thinking which is to say it's the coincidence of fission and fusion. The idea that what drives or propels a dialectical process is not, is a, is not a determinate negation to begin with, but this, orig this splitting, which is also a fusion. And this is this Hegel's most radical challenge to uh, the law of identity and the, the principle of non-contradiction. Um, and this challenge is not, it subverts any kind of conceptual logic which is predicated on the law of identity. This is why, as uh, Ladendolar writes, Hegel's atom, his elementary particle, is the atom itself as that which cannot be divided, as the division, as the indivisible division, okay? the split on which any unity is premised. Uh, and this is also why, in, in Dolar's reading, the subject is the clinamen of substance, the way that it always necessarily strays from itself. So the clinamen is precisely not to be understood as the deviation from a pre-existing trajectory. It's not, um, it's not the kind of the, uh, the deviation in the, the linear trajectory of, of the atom, as kind of traditionally conceived, but it's kind of, it's an originary deviation. It's a, it's a deviation um, which is not uh, related back to any kind of pre-existing traje trajectory. So in other words, it's not the deviation of a substantial thing. Um, um, so, already, so if in Hegelian negativity there's a deviation, um, a deviation of negation operative, um, and if Hegelian negation is already a deviation, one deviating from its track and splitting into two, then with psychoanalysis, what with psychoanalytic negativity introduces a kind of deviation of deviation, okay? Um, or what Dolar calls a clinamen of the clinamen, a redoubling of clinamen. And again, the, the key import of this is to say that this is a, a negation that produces something that it cannot itself negate. So here you have a kind of uh, a negation that doesn't work in the Hegelian sense, that cannot be... Uh, that cannot be determined, conceptually determined, to yield a new form. Um, so, now, one, okay, I have a, one question here is how this relates, there's, um, the expression self-relating negativity is very important both uh, in Zizek and uh, Ladin Dolar's readings. Um, but the crux of self-relating negativity in Hegel, it seems to be, well, there's, there's an account of it in his famous Logic of Essence, which um, articulates uh, the objective and subjective domains. Um, because Hegel describes where um, being is the becoming of something, okay, um, the becoming of an entity is its, its a determinate becoming, becoming something. Um, in the realm of essence, essence is the movement from nothing to nothing and thereby back to itself. Um, transition or becoming sublates itself in, this, in its transition. The other which comes to be in this transition is not the non-being of a being, but the nothingness of a nothingness. And this, to be the negation of a nothingness, constitutes being. Because essence, um, essence is, uh, you know, mediates subjectivity and objectivity. And ultimately, uh, essence uh, crystallizes in contradiction. The essence of everything that is, is contradiction. Um, and the Hegelian wager is that contradiction itself can be determined. Classical logic rejects contradiction precisely because um, from a contradiction, anything can be deduced. You can never determine a contradiction. Anything falls from the negation of a contradiction. Hegel wants to suspend the law of identity, the principle of non-contradiction, but he still believes you can, that, that contradiction exerts a determining power. It, it, it can be conceptualized, determinately conceptualized. 
Um, so, um, contradiction then, and okay, so the Hegel's con you know, contradiction then has both a formal and a material aspect, okay? In other words, there's contradiction at, at the level of conceptual impossibility, contradiction indexes conceptual impossibility, but then there must be a kind of, uh, uh, if there's a kind of such a thing as, uh, what, if there are blockages and impasses at the level of the unconscious, what you have are material impossibilities. Okay? You have something um, equivalent to material impossibility. And this is important then to understand the, the task of psychoanalysis. And here is Zizek describing um, the, the, you know, traver, you know, the, the, the basic kind of uh, wager of psychoanalysis. The premise of psychoanalysis is that one can intervene with the symbolic into the real because the real is not external reality in itself, but a crack in the symbolic. So one can intervene with an act which reconfigures the field 